Last week I tore down a Honda J35 V6, which when it blew up, it probably registered somewhere on the Richter scale. It was most likely the worst core we've seen on the channel, and it might be the worst engine that I myself have ever torn down in my life, which is hard to think about. But instead of another horrifically blown up engine, I wanted to show Toyota's counterpart to that. I've gotten a lot of requests for this engine, so today we're going to tear down a Toyota 2GRFE. This particular engine is out of a 2008 Toyota Sienna with about 170,000 miles on it. Yes, details! I know you guys asked for that stuff. And this is a claimed bad engine. Now, the 2GR was used in so many vehicles that I'm not going to list them. So many things from the mid-2000s till way into the teens. It was in the Camry, the ES, the RAV4, the Highlander, a lot of Lexus RXs. I'm not going to list them all. It was even used in the Lotus Evora. And this is a very highly loved engine. A lot of people say that these are one of the best Toyota V6s ever made. They make 271 horsepower or more, depending on what the application is. And for the most part, you never hear anything bad about them. But there's one thing I can't figure out, and that is, if they're so good, and I'm not doubting that they are good, but if they're that good, why are used engines still $1,500? When the 3MZs were never that expensive, that was the engine this replaced. So what gives? Why are they expensive? You Toyota techs that watch this channel, or guys that work on cars all the time, what kills these things? Now today, we're going to find out what killed this one, hopefully, and Hopefully I'm not tearing down a good engine. I'd like to take a moment and talk about business ethics. These cores come from all over the place. They come from repair shops and garages. Sometimes they come from other salvage yards. They even come from my own customers. I'll sell them a good engine and in partial exchange, I'll get their old one back. And these cores usually look pretty bad. Usually they're locked up, they're half dismantled, or my personal favorite, when you can see through them. I like those the most. And sometimes I go out hunting for cores specifically for this channel, which is how I got this 2GR. And they look perfectly fine. They turn over great. The plugs may look good. You can compression and leak down test them and find no problems. You can even pull the pan and inspect bearings in the pickup and see nothing wrong. But anytime an engine is suspected as bad, like this one is, and it's written on it in three different places, I can't sell that because there is one thing that is more wasteful than tearing down a good engine, and that is selling a bad one and wasting someone's time for them to install an engine just to find out it's actually bad. All the tests in the world short of installing it into a car can't prove it's good, and I can't hear it run, so therefore, even though it may be perfectly fine, we're gonna tear this engine all the way down. Like normal, the first thing we're going to do is pull the plugs, so then we gotta pull the coils. For the rear bank, I need to remove this bracket. The plugs all look pretty decent. There's nothing glaringly wrong. I will say that they look like they're pretty worn. I think they factory spec is 39 to 43 thousandths when new and up to 55 is the maximum allowance but the uh, feeler gauge in my eyeballs hasn't been calibrated in a while so I can't tell you if these are in spec or not I will say that the tube seals were leaking pretty good now that the plugs are out of it we're gonna turn this engine over and see how it feels I don't feel anything terrible yet It does turn over pretty well. Eh, it might be a couple tight spots there. Like right there. I don't know. The next thing I need to do is kind of clean this up a little bit. We're going to get the cut wiring harness off of it so that we can pull the intake. Hmm, it doesn't look like I'll be able to uh, take this off without taking the plenum off. So that's what we'll do next. And 
and the harness is off. Now I'll just remove this lower plenum. Now this should just come right off. Well, let's take a look. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, uh-huh, uh-huh. Mmm. Oh, mm-hmm. Yep, mm-hmm. Starting in the front bank, you can see there's definitely some debris sitting on top of that valve. That one looks okay, valves are open. Don't see any major issues yet. And on the rear bank, that one looks all right. Same there, but this. It looks like a bunch of melted stuff. Looks like melted plastic. Let's go look at that intake manifold. Well, uh, uh-oh, that's no good. That's, uh, that's plastic. It's melted. Well, it looks like we're tearing down an overheat job here. I've never seen these uh, stalagmites and stalactites hanging out of an intake like that. <laughs> well, I think that one's going in the scrap bin, or I guess it's plastic, so sadly not. Now I'd like to peel the valve cover off, but first we have to get this oil line that feeds the variable valve timing out of the way. I know, I'm not supposed to do that. It's bad for my hand. First look at oil coming out of this thing. It's oil. Next, I'm gonna remove the VVT solenoids. Those look pretty decent. That one does too. I actually have to remove this oil line all the way, so. Now just a whole bunch of 10s and 12s. Did I miss one? Or is this just glued down that good? There's a dowel on the head right here. Oh, God. does this smell bad? Oh. Why did I take such a deep breath? <coughs> oh, you'd think I'd learned something by now. This really doesn't look too bad in here. Everything's where it's supposed to be. Now, I can't come up with something that funny to describe the smell because it's just vomit. That's the only word I could accurately describe the way this thing smells. Very same process for the rear. That one has a flexible section. I read that they, they make an upgraded line for this. I don't know why they use rubber with uh, oil. That's interesting. That one looks all right. These both look pretty good. And move on to the bolts that hold the valve cover down. Saw that blue. Well, the inside of this cylinder head looks pretty similar. Nothing really jumping out at me. Chain looks pretty good. Next, I'd like to look at the bottom of the valve covers. This valve cover looks nice and tidy. This is the front cylinder head. Nothing wrong here. But then you get to the rear cylinder head, and what is this? 
Is this what I think it is? Milkshake? Caramel flavored? I'm not gonna taste test that, but that is water and oil or coolant and oil mixed. Not what you wanna find. Next, I'm gonna start cleaning up the engine cover, preparing it for removal. We're gonna have to flip the engine over eventually to get that off, but let's start with all these pulleys and some brackets. I'm actually going to get the rear coolant crossover out of the way. It'll make things a little easier. Let's see if we can get this off of here. I don't know what just came out of the cooling system, but okay. Now, let's see if we can get this thermostat housing. Is it just the three? I think it's just the three. Oh, and a hose clamp. Oh, there's still some Toyota coolant in there. I'm just going to keep turning this until it pops. See? See? Now let's get the water pump pulley out. Now it's time to remove the water pump. Whole bunch of 10 millimeter headed bolts. Looks like a couple 12s. All right, I think the rest are 12s. The following is made for mature viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. Okay, we're leaking. Um, this is shaped kind of like a, um, well, let's just call it the trifecta. So here's the water pump. And it's clearly been leaking right here. You can see there's the weep hole. There's crusty red Toyota coolant. Could that have leaked enough over time to cause this thing to overheat? I bet that played a major role. Definitely wouldn't want to use this water pump in any situation. Now let's look at the coolant that's coming out of this thing. I mean, Toyota coolant is red. There's a lot of dirt, a lot of junk in here. Coolant doesn't look uh, as red as it does brown. Now the coolant in the higher parts of the engine looked more red than this. It could just be the sediment that's right there. Now let's get this crank pulley out of the way. Man, that's too easy. I do need to turn this engine over so I have access to the bottom of the timing cover. But first, before I make a giant Exxon Valdez on my floor, we're going to make sure that it's drained. It takes just a second. What? It's drained. It's drained. Just to be sure, I'm going to remove the oil filter. Think. Can I have my ratchet back? Okay, give me my ratchet back. Oh, there's oil in there. I guess I've just donated my ratchet. Well, that oil stinks, and it's really sludgy. Wow. Well, this is pretty crazy. What I thought was sludge is actually, looks like the filter is melted. Well, give it to me, let go. I think it's melted to the housing. It, is there like a thing that releases this? Did I do something wrong here? Come on, I want to look at you. Give it to me. Nope, that is, uh, that's one piece. I'm gonna give it one more go. Come on. 
just let go. It just, it, it, it refuses. Come on, just, I'm making a mess now. I want my ratchet back. Aw. Oh, give it, just, will you come, let, all right. I give up. I give up. It's not coming out. Give me my ratchet back. I need that. Now, it is time to flip this engine over. Oh, there's a whole bunch of ploppy oil. Just gonna kinda let it sit on its side there. Do its thing. Well, when I flipped this thing over, it made a giant mess. This coolant that is coming out of this engine kind of looks like uh, transmission fluid. It's not supposed to do that. We're just going to use some pig man here and clean it all up. My guys go through this stuff like water. Now it is time to remove the lower oil pan. Okay. Now let's see if we can pop the sealant with this. Ew. It's, uh oh. Is that sparkles? The forbidden glitter. I did not expect that. Oh, and the pickup. Bad. Well, I expected a normal overheat after I pulled the intake manifold. I did not expect to find this sparkly sludge in here. Sparkle sludge is bad. And, uh, well, surprises still. And some of that is in the pickup. Of find in there. There's no large pieces of anything. I wonder where this came from. Before I go any further, I need to remove the dipstick tube. Now, it's a Toyota. It may fight me. It may not. Plus, I'm going the other direction with it. That's not what I meant. What I mean is I'm, I'm going down. I should have pulled this when it was standing upright. It's going to be fine. It's just going to boop right out. Oh, I didn't even need to take that bracket out. Is it coming out? Oh, I just, oh. Not only did that hurt, it sprayed me in the face. This whipped. That was bad. Now, let's get this upper oil pan out of the way, which, for some reason, I have bolts in on the engine stand. Oh, boy. Why did I do this? Actually, it's just one. We'll be okay. We're just gonna remove this bolt. You know, perfectly fine. Three is good, four is better. I could have used this bolt hole right here. What was I thinking? Now that I've got the stand situated, got a couple more 10 millimeter bolts back here. It's gonna be like that, huh? Now I should be able to pry this off. The sealant looks like it's pretty strong. So I'm not quite sure what it's going to take. Ah, that's not too bad. Now what? Oh, it's this tube. Much like the lower pan, the upper pan has some signs of metal and forbidden glitter. Some chunky stuff there. The last thing I need to do before I flip this engine back over 
is remove the pickup. Before you start on the timing cover, I need to remove this last VVT oil line. Now, just a whole bunch of 12 millimeter bolts and 114. Finally, I'm really hoping this just comes right off. There we are. Well, this is a very simple timing system. All the parts look really well made. I don't really see anything wrong in here. Tensioner doesn't look overextended. And the rails look worn. I don't see any bits of anything in here. This all looks quite tidy. Now I'm gonna get these cam gears loose. The next thing I'm going to do is remove the timing chain tensioner. And lucky for you guys, safety tote has returned. I have no idea if that was violent or not, but that's the beauty of safety tote. Now I think we can start pulling these rails off, take a better look. Wow, that thing looks, looks perfect. I guess these just kind of slide on these pins. That one looks good. And that one looks good. Does this chain come off easy? Oh, that's fine. Don't worry about that. Uh, look at that chain, man. Wow, what a beauty. I've got one more rail. This one actually bolts on. I dropped it without looking at it. That's not as much fun. Somehow that survived the drop. Looks great. I'd definitely reuse this. Before I go cramming these bolts loose, I want to talk about the way I want to take this apart. So in the past, I just take all the bolts out and sometimes parts go flying. Hopefully not in this situation because this is similar to the UR engines I've torn down where they have a top plate, or I guess you guys call it a cam tower. And you guys told me, you don't have to pull the cams out, you can just pull the larger bolts out, and then everything comes out with the cams, which would mean I don't even have to touch this bridge chain. I just can remove the top half of it with the cams in it, and everything should be easy peasy. So we're gonna try that. Uh, I have no idea if it's gonna work, but let's give it a whirl. Let's see if that works. Ha ha, you guys were right. See, I do read all the comments. That's so cool. So one downside of pulling it apart that way is that we can't easily look at the cam journals. So I may pull one of those apart just to take a peek. But this does give us access to the rollers. Everything seems to be pretty good, but there is a tinge of metal, not too bad. It's not the best looking in here, but we've definitely seen worse. Before we take the main head bolts out, we need to take these two front head bolts out. Oh, come on, you can do it. Maybe you can't. All right, let's get the breaker bar. Now we can break the main head bolts loose.
right? It should be done leaking. Let's see here. Well, I don't see anything terrible on the head gasket. It's an MLS gasket, so it does take a lot. Well, the pistons are pretty clean, and if it was eating coolant, that explains why they're clean. But if you look closely, there's some vertical scratches on the bore, and then really bad ones right here. That's uh, not good. I wonder if something got caught in there or what that was. But I think everything's connected. I don't have any reason to suspect that any of these rods are broken. So we'll likely just move on to the other side after we look at the cylinder head. The cylinder head doesn't look too bad. Obviously, you need a straight edge to figure out if it's warped. But I don't see any, any big cracks or anything like that. No major damage that I can easily see with the naked eye. Check out these knock sensors. They're melted. I wonder how hot it has to be before those melt. I'm going to go with... So hot. Onto the rear head. so easy. Similar story on this side. A little more junk built up, especially like down here in the corner. Some sparkles there, but it's just about the same. I don't see any issues with the valve train. This head does not have any extra head bolts. It's just the ones that surround the combustion chamber, so we'll start on those. Let's see what's going on here. What? What? Whoa! Whoa! It's gone! The bore is gone! And the piston's melted. That one's full of plastic. Wow! I guess, uh, what is falling in my shop? Okay. I guess. If it's hot enough to melt this, of course it would be hot enough to melt a knock sensor. I'm impressed. I am, I'm really impressed. That is just amazing. It just torched right through it. I wonder what the rest of that piston is going to look like. And that one, that one is what ate all of the plastic. It's just chewing on it. I wonder if we're going to see any damage because of that. <laughs> Let's go look at that cylinder head. That is, that's awesome. Well, it's very apparent where the breach was here. I'm going to spray this down and clean this up. And then look at all the plastic. It's stuck between the valve, the valve seat. This head's probably uh, probably not ready to go back on. I guess now it's time to uh, flip this thing upside down, start pulling the rotating assembly out. Let me guess, you're gonna leak some more? Uh, not too much. Now let's get this windage tray out of here. It's a lot different than the last engine I tore down. That was a blowage tray. That one's in good shape, but 
There's definitely some metal deposits in here. Well, this all looks pretty decent in here. There's nothing loose, but we didn't feel any rod knock when we were turning that crank back and forth at first. Now, depending on how the rod bearings look, will determine whether I pull the oil pump apart. If the rod bearings look okay, I'm not going to pull the oil pump off that timing cover, which would render that worthless, essentially. But if there's some damage to the rod bearings significant enough, then we'll pull the oil pump apart. Now I need to turn the crank over so we can start at the front. Got to be clean about this. Well, we seem to be jammed up in here. Why did that happen? Wow, that practically fell out of the bore. Wow, these just slip right out. Well, that one's not falling out. Need help there. Oh, that one may have some trouble coming out. The rod bearings look really good. I expected them to look much worse considering the amount of metal we found in this engine. The only one that doesn't look so great is this one right here. And it's really, it's on the cusp of being bad. We'll have to take a closer look at that uh, crank journal when we pull that out. But I'm hoping I get a good crank out of this. Let's talk about rods and pistons. So one thing I noticed is that the wrist pins are pretty stiff. Not going to say it. That's the piston that chewed on some plastic, but that'll all come off. The more worrying thing is you see how that top compression rings kind of loose in the land of rings. Not all of it, but the second compression ring is, is like carbon locked or it's collapsed from overheating. And then look at the amount of coked up oil in here. That's crazy. Yeah, these are supposed to be very easy to move. And they are on some of them, but not the way they're supposed to. Same deal on this. The top ring, first compression ring, isn't bad looking. The second ring is bad. Then we get into the fun stuff. These are the middle two cylinders. These are really stiff. And as you can see, there's lots of damage to the piston. I think what happened here is this engine got so hot that these pistons swelled and distorted and started transferring some of that aluminum to the bore. They no longer are round. That is pretty bad. And then there's this next one. As you can see, it totally covers that compression ring. It's only on that one part. It's not... I guess it is bad. Now, for the coup de gras. I said that wrong, I'm sure. That's not good. That's torched through the rings and even the oil ring. There's a problem. That got really hot. In fact, there's a uh, powdered aluminum all up in the top of the piston. 
this one is pretty much locked up, this wrist pin. Now this one's not really melted, but yeah. So normally I'd try to be careful, but since this is already off of the cylinder head, <laughs> What have I done here? This was a poor choice. Maybe I can just take the cam gear off. That's what we're gonna do. The cams look pretty nice. I don't know if they're worth anything. And the journals and the cam towers look good. I was worried that some of that aluminum would have run through this, but. This all looks pretty decent. A little bit of wear on the cam caps, but it's nowhere near as bad as we've seen with some of the oil starved motors. Before we get the main cap bolts, we need to remove this rear main seal plate, which I've already removed the bolts from. I'll come back to that. Now, I really don't have to worry about these uh, main caps, they just have to come out. The main bearings actually look pretty good. I didn't really suspect we'd find any major damage, but they do look good. Not bad for 170,000 miles. The crankshaft doesn't look too bad either. All of the journals look nice. The one I wanted to pay attention to is going to be this one here. That's the one that had the worst looking bearing. And as you can see, there is a few, few marks on that journal, but I bet that would polish out. I think this might be one of the few sellable parts out of this engine. First, we're going to start on the good side. And when I say good, it's, uh, it's all relative. That's probably the nicest bore. And then that one has uh, some pretty extreme damage there. That one isn't as bad, but still some vertical scratches. Now let's go to the other side. More vertical scratches. And then a lot of aluminum transfer. That is all pieces of piston. Even on that side, and then blown apart block. So I look down in there and I don't really see, I really don't see what that, where that metal went. But I did hear a few things drop when I was turning this engine over. So I'll look for that in a second. But you can see that that is really Pretty much not repairable, not worth it. I mean, I there's, there's these engines aren't that expensive. This got extremely hot. Look at those knock sensors. Well, there's the piece I found, and uh, it looks like it would fit just fine. Broke the block. I think I figured something out tonight. Anytime my wife finds something in the fridge that may or may not be good, I'm always the smell tester. And I always take the biggest, deepest breath possible. And it's always instant regret because it's rotten. There's, she doesn't need to ask me. And this was the same way. When I took a breath of this, I already knew the first little tinge, I knew this doesn't smell good, but I took a deep breath of it anyway. It's me, I'm the problem. Or my wife just messes with me because she knows I'll take a deep breath. Either way, this one stunk. And it wasn't 
as bad as the Honda Fit. I think that one was much worse, but you know, smell memories, that was a long time ago. This was right now. So right now that seems like it was worse. This just goes to prove that it doesn't matter how good anything is. It doesn't matter if it's the most reliable bulletproof engine on the planet, someone will kill it. Someone will do something, ignore all of the signs. Toyota Siennas have a temperature gauge. They could have seen it, it was right in front of their face. All they had to do was look and go, hey, that's not right. And then, I don't know, maybe the steam or the pool of coolant underneath your vehicle when you park it, because that water pump was leaking for some time. And I, I would suspect that that's what caused the overheat. Water pumps do fail, it's a thing. This one is a pretty easy one to do. I don't think it's a terribly expensive job to have done. So maybe they thought they could just get by with keeping it full and they took it on a long trip. Either way, this thing was cooked. It was hot. And I doubted if it was gonna be bad or not, but oh yeah, it was bad. Now there's not much to sell out of this unless somebody wants the rods and pistons for their desk. I've been selling pretty much all of the bad parts out of these engines lately. So if you like any of that or anything else off of this engine, or if you want to buy anything off of my previous teardowns, just shoot us an email or you can go to importapart.com and peruse our entire inventory. If you don't see what you're looking for, you can click the request a part tab, which sends us an email of exactly what it is you're looking for. I really hope you enjoyed this teardown as always. I love all the comments, all the feedback, and even the criticism. I love it all, and I'll catch you on the next one.